previous lecture we started talking about uh, uh, nonlinear finite element model development. We started by discussing sources of nonlinearity, and we saw that uh, the main source of nonlinearity uh, could be due to strain displacement relations being nonlinear. That is called geometric nonlinearity, and uh, the stress strain relations could be nonlinear. That is material nonlinearity. There could be nonlinearity associated with boundary conditions or energy dissipation mechanisms. So, the various schemes uh, of um, classification are possible. All these nonlinearities can coexist in a problem. So, in this case, uh, what is shown here is uh, uh, small displacements and small strains, but uh, there is material nonlinearity here. Uh, whereas in this case, there is material could be linear or nonlinear, but there are large rotations but small strains. Here, material again could be linear or nonlinear. There is large rotation and large strains. And this is a schematic of a situation where there could be uh, nonlinearity associated with boundary conditions. Uh, so this spring will come into action only when this displacement here exceeds this threshold, in which case the stiffness of the system increases. Uh, here the loading and unloading path will be uh, tracing each other, whereas in material nonlinearity the unloading path will be different from uh, the loading path. After reviewing a uh, uh, few details about qualitative feature of nonlinear system response and how it differs from response of linear systems, we started talking about uh, elements of continuum mechanics and I briefly started talking about kinematics that is study of motion and deformation without concerning the causes of motion and uh, deformation. So we have a um, configuration uh, at time equal to 0. Uh, it is here and this is this could be the reference configuration and this is a Cartesian coordinate system in which the position of particles uh, in the in the material points in this body are described. So P uh, the position vector of P is X and after deformation um, this point P with position vector X gets mapped to point P with position vector lower X through this transformation. And P, P is the displacement vector. Uh, defined as u of x minus x. So in um, Lagrangian descriptions, we treat uh, the coordinates of capital P, that is capital X1, X2, X3 as the independent variables. Whereas in Eulerian uh, system, we treat the current position, the, the position of particle P in the current configuration, that is lowercase x1, x2, x3 as the independent variables, uh, that is Eulerian system. So in solid mechanics problem, often um, uh, Lagrangian coordinate system is used. Now let us consider uh, a line segment PQ in the body B at uh, in the reference configuration and due to this deformation this point PQ moves to this position uh, PQ as shown here and the initial length is uh, D capital X this is D lowercase x. So various position vectors of PQ in the t equal to 0 and at some time t are shown here. Now the position vector in the current configuration is a function of uh, the position in the original configuration and I can write x1, x2, x3 in the long hand in this form and from this I deduce dx1 is dou x1 by dou x1 into dx1 etc. that is shown here. So uh, this set of equations where I get dx1, dx2, dx3 which are components of position vector in the deformed configuration which are related to the components of position vector in undeformed configuration through this matrix and this matrix is known as deformation gradient uh, tensor. So we get this equation in matrix notation it is dx is equal to f dx in, uh, in the initial notation it is dx i is f i j dx j or in tensor notation it is f dot dx. <coughs> the determinant of this matrix f is known as Jacobian. Um, by inverting this relation, uh, I can also hear the uh, components of line segment in the deformed configuration are related to component of position vector in the original configuration. This can be inverted and I can get this relation and dx is f inverse dx. We have displacement where, uh, vector as u is x minus x and from which I get du is dx minus dx and du I can write therefore as uh, for dx I will write f dx 
So, this is f minus i dx and this matrix f minus i, uh, I call it as capital G and this is a displacement gradient with respect to reference configuration. Alternatively, I can express cap, uh, d capital X in terms of d lowercase x through this relation and I get this as i minus f inverse into dx and this matrix is known as J naught. So, this is displacement gradients with respect to current configuration. So, this G and J naught matrices are uh, shown here. This is with respect to displacements, uh, whereas this is with respect to <coughs> uh, the position uh, coordinates of the position vector. So, G is this, J naught is this, but for small deformation, uh, G and J naught uh, are related through this uh, relation. So, um, in small deformation, these relations apply. We can consider a few examples. Suppose I have uh, the displacement field given by uh, lambda e1 x1, lambda e2 x2, lambda e3 x3, uh, with such that, so that x1 x2 x3 are respectively lambda x1, lambda x2, and lambda x3. The displacement u1 u2 u3 will be lambda minus x1 x1 and lambda minus 1 x2, lambda minus 1 x3. From this, I get the deformation, uh, this matrix F as this and this type of deformation is called pure dilatation. Now another example, I will consider x as 1 plus alpha e1 x1 plus e2 x2 plus e3 x3. So that x1 is 1 plus alpha x1 from which I get u1 is alpha x1 and x2 and x3 are uh, such that u2 and u3 are 0 from which I get f to be given by this. So this deformation is called pure extension. Now, I can consider x to be uh, a into x plus c. Uh, from this, it follows u is a minus i x plus c and f is simply a. When the matrix f is independent of x, we say that the deformation is homogeneous. A slightly more involved, uh, another example. Here, <coughs> x1 is x1 plus gamma x2. x2 is lambda x2, x3 is lambda x3. So that the F matrix will be given by this and this deformation is called uh, 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 pure shear. Now here I have a um, displacement field where uh, there are nonlinear terms x1 into x2 and so on and so forth. So u1 will be gamma1 x1 x2, u2 x2 is gamma2 x1 x2 and x3 is gamma3 x2 x3 from which I get f to be this which is a function of now x1 x2 x3 and uh, such deformation are called non-homogeneous. So they are simple illustrations. Now this phi of x comma t which maps uh, uh, the position vector uh, uh, x to lowercase x uh, certain it has to satisfy certain conditions. Uh, this function is continuous, uh, continuously differentiable and this is 1 to 1 and uh, that means uh, f matrix can be inverted. So dx is f dx and j is the Jacobian determinant of f. Uh, we impose the condition j to be greater than 0. Uh, you can see that uh, the determinant can be expressed in terms of displacements uh, as shown here. If all displacements are 0, then I get j equal to 1. So for f to be invertible, j must not be equal to 0 because uh, it is determinant of f for f inverse to exist, determinant of f must not be 0. So upon deformation, j cannot become negative without crossing j equal to 0. So hence we impose a condition that j must be greater than or equal to 0 and these are uh, such motions are admissible motions. Now I can, uh, an example of a motion which is not, exam, uh, not admissible is shown here. You can verify that this is not admissible. I mentioned in the previous lecture that rotations play a crucial role in um, analysis of uh, nonlinear systems. So let us consider a displacement field where there is a rigid body translation and a rotation. This R matrix is a rotation matrix. So this relation is expressed in matrix form here, indicial form here and a tensorial form as shown here. Uh, this R of t is a rotation matrix, xt of t is a rigid body translation. Now from this equation, I, if I find dx, it will be r dx plus dxt of t. Uh, dxt of t is 0 because rigid body translation implies no change in length. Therefore, this is r dx. 
Now if you find the length uh, dxt uh, square of the length dxt dx uh, and if I for dx if I write um, this equation I get dx transpose r transpose r dx since r transpose r is a uh, identity matrix because r is a rotation matrix I get uh, this. Uh, so this is uh, this length remains unchanged therefore uh, I mean I have to verify that R transpose R is I therefore uh, the argument is uh, the length in a rigid body uh, rotation and translation length does not change therefore dxt transpose dx must be equal to dxt uh, dx uh, therefore this is true for any dx consequently I get the uh, relation that R transpose R is I or in other words R transpose is R inverse that is R is orthogonal. Now how does pictorially it looks like suppose you consider a triangular uh, domain uh, upon this transformation Rx plus Xt uh, this R uh, effect of R is to rotate this as shown here and Xt the effect of Xt is to translate. So this is how the element looks upon undergoing this deformation. Now, uh, if we consider two coordinate systems xj and xj prime such that uh, a position vector in xj system is xj ej and position vector in xj prime coordinate system is xj prime ej prime where ei uh, are the unit vectors in xj system and ej prime are the unit vectors in xj prime system. Now uh, repeated indices imply summation here now clearly this um, dot product of EI EJ is delta EJ and uh, so since this is equal I get this relation I will uh, dot product with EI uh, and I get this and from this I denote uh, EJ prime dot EI as RJI and uh, this gives me the relationship between XI and XJ prime. Uh, and similarly I consider this equation and again do another dot product this time with EI prime I get uh, this relation. So from this uh, analysis we get that X is R transpose X prime and X prime is R X. So uh, this is how a, a vector undergoes transformation due to coordinate transformation. By using similar arguments we can show that a tensor like stress undergoes transformation following this rule. We introduce uh, another quantity known as uh, angular velocity. So we consider again the rigid body translation and the rotation as shown here and I differentiate this with respect to time I get x dot is r dot x plus x dot t t. Now for x <coughs> I will write uh, using this relation it is x minus xt of t into uh, r inverse of that and r inverse is rt and I get this relation. So from this I get um, this equation I re rewrite in this form by denoting r dot r transpose by capital omega and this quantity is known as angular velocity tensor. Now <coughs> we can show that this angular velocity tensor is a uh, skew symmetric matrix to show that we consider d by dt of r r transpose uh, since r r transpose is identity matrix this must be equal to 0. So uh, that means r dot r transpose plus r r dot transpose must be 0 from which I get the relation omega must be equal to minus omega transpose therefore omega is skew symmetric and this will have this form. A simple example. I consider x equal to 2x plus 3yt and y is 2xt plus 3y. So the question is examine the admissibility of the motion, sketch the configuration of the element at t equal to 0.5 second and determine the displacement, velocity and acceleration fields. So the domain is uh, OAB is described here this length is 1, this length is also 1. So deformation gradient uh, you can easily evaluate it to be this and the Jacobian will be 6 minus 60 square and this has to uh, for motion to be admissible this has to be greater than 0 therefore this motion is admissible only for t less than 1. Uh, at t equal to half I will put for t, uh, t half I get this displacement field and I can map the points uh, the 3 points here uh, O, A, B uh, and I will plot them in the transform coordinate and find out the displacement field and velocity field and acceleration field and 
this triangle is the OA prime B prime is the how this is how the triangle looks upon deformation at t equal to half okay. Now there are other few things that I am stating without proof some of this we have done but other couple of things I am not doing. Upon deformation uh, dx becomes f dx this we have shown similarly area element and volume element undergo transformation as shown here dA is jf uh, transpose inverse into dA and volume is dV is jdV. Uh, Fij I al as we already discussed it dou x pi dou xj and inverse of this is this and j is the Jacobian uh, so uh, is the determinant of f called the Jacobian. So these two results I am stating without proof you can uh, with some effort you will be able to show that. There is an important concept known as polar decomposition um, theorem and that leads to notion of stretch and rotation tensors. The main idea is this the motion of a line segment can be expressed as a pure deformation followed by a rigid body rotation or a rigid body rotation followed by a pure deformation that is f can be written as r into u or v into r where r is a rotation matrix and u and v are symmetric positive definite matrices. So for pure rigid body rotations f is r and consequently u will be i and v will be i. Now uh, for other situations we can work out uh, how, uh, how u can be determined is as follows we consider f equal to r u and from this I get f transpose f is f transpose r u and for uh, f transpose I write u transpose r transpose and this becomes u transpose u which is u square. So from this I get u is to be square root of f transpose f. Similarly if I consider the second relation f equal to vr I get uh, post multiplying by f transpose I get f f transpose as vr f, f transpose and uh, again uh, by making the substitutions we, sh we show that v is square root of f f transpose. So how to find r from a given f u is uh, we first we find u and v by a square root of f transpose f and f f transpose square root of f f transpose f is r u therefore r is f u inverse or alternatively f is v r r is v inverse f. Now this quantity f transpose f is known as denoted by CR and it is known as right Cauchy Green's uh, stretch tensor and CL which is FF transpose is left Cauchy Green stretch tensor. Clearly they are symmetric and positive definite. So, so that can be verified uh, by inspection here. Now how do you find the square root of a symmetric positive definite matrix uh, quickly we can recall uh, let A be a n by n symmetric positive definite matrix. Uh, let us consider the eigenvalue problem a phi equal to lambda phi. Let phi be the matrix of eigenvectors such that it is phi transpose a phi is capital lambda and phi transpose phi is i. So this lambda is a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues uh, obtained by solving this problem and we know that these lambdas are non uh, positive and phi is real valued. So uh, from this I can write a as phi lambda phi transpose. Now let b be square root of a that is what I wish to find out. So and I consider b equal to phi d phi transpose I do not know what is d. So from this I get b square is phi d transpose uh, phi d phi transpose into uh, phi d phi transpose but phi transpose phi is i that is how we have normalized this will therefore will be phi d square phi transpose. Uh, this is uh, equal to a because b square is a and consequently by comparing these two relations I get lambda to be. Um, uh, d square e will be equal to lambda capital lambda and therefore d is square root lambda. So b is therefore obtained as phi square root lambda phi transpose. So this gives uh, uh, interpretation of what is the square root of a matrix. Now we will now talk about measures of strain. Now there are two requirements that uh, we need to satisfy first is uh, the strains must vanish when body undergoes rigid body motion. Uh, secondly the strains coincide with the infinitesimal strains in the limit of strains becoming small. So any measure of strain that we develop should conform to this and we can ask begin by asking the question why do we need new measures of strain why not be content with linear measures of strain that is infinitesimal strains. 
Now the problem with infinitesimal strains is that linear measure of strain does not lead to zero strains for structures undergoing rigid body rotations. How do we see that? We can consider a small example. You consider a two dimensional example of an element which is rotated by angle theta. It is a rigid body rotation. So the uh, de deformation is given by x is equal to uh, x1 x2 is cos theta minus sin theta sin theta cos theta x1 x2. So for this deformation for no any value of theta we expect that there would not be any uh, the strains would be 0. Now we can find the displacement field u1 is uh, x minus x1, uh, x1 this and u2 is this and from which I compute the strain infinitesimal strain component dou u1 by dou x1 is cos theta minus 1 epsilon yy is dou u2 by dou x2 which is cos theta minus 1 and uh, shear strain is 0. Now you look at epsilon xx and epsilon yy they are not 0 but of course as theta goes to 0 uh, this goes to 0 that is okay but for large theta epsilon xx and epsilon yy do not vanish. Uh, this is why we need to redefine strain when you are considering large uh, problems with large displacements. Now uh, to examine this in a slightly greater detail we can consider cos theta minus 1 this, this can be shown to be equal to minus theta square by 2 plus order of theta to the power of 4 and approximately we can take it as theta square by 2. So based on this we will be able to judge when to abandon linear strain measures. So when theta is large uh, we need to abandon. So just to quickly see that suppose the strain being measured is about 0 0.01 and acceptable accuracy is about 1% of that so this is accuracy. Now the term that, that we are ignoring in linear strain approximation is of the, of the order theta square by 2. We assume theta to be small so that theta square by 2 can be ignored. So the, for the approximation to be acceptable theta has to be less than this which is about 0 0.01 radians. So if you want if you are dealing with strains of about 0 0.01 and you want to characterize with 1% accuracy the rotation should not cross this. Similarly if the strain being measured is about 10 to the power of minus 4 and acceptable accuracy is 10 to the power of minus 6 that is again 1% error the linear measure of strain is acceptable if theta is less than 0 0.001 radians. Now obviously if theta exceeds this uh, the measure infinitesimal strain measures are not acceptable. Now it is important to note that if the structure is on the verge of losing stability small strains can cause large rotations. So we cannot use linear measures of strain in buckling analysis that is why we uh, you know if you recall we use uh, nonlinear strain displacement relations when we did buckling analysis. Now equipped with this we can introduce this, the first strain measure that is green Lagrange strain measure. We have seen this earlier but in a slightly different notation dx is f into dx and therefore length of an element uh, ds square is dx transpose dx. This is in the deformed configuration and in the original configuration it is this. So the change in square of the length is ds square minus ds square and this I can write in this form. Now for dx if I use the relation f dx I can rewrite this as dx transpose f transpose f dx minus dx transpose dx. So I will write this quantity in this form dx transpose f transpose f minus i into dx. This quantity in the parenthesis um, I call it as 2 into uh, tensor E defined as half of f transpose f minus i. This quantity is known as green Lagrange strain measure. Now um, we can relate this to displacement gradients of the displacement. So we have u is x minus x that is dou u by dou x is dou x by dou x minus i and we have g is equal to f minus i and for f if I write now i plus g I will be able to get that and upon slight simplification uh, I get uh, E as this. Now one of the requirements that we stipulated is under rigid body uh, motions uh, the strain measure should go to 0. So we can verify whether that is true here. Huh. So I again consider uh, rigid body motions as R into x plus x t of t. So this is translation this is rotation R is a uh, rotation matrix. So f is R of t in this case and if I substitute uh, that into this I get uh, f transpose is R transpose here it is R transpose R minus i and R transpose R is i therefore uh, this is 0. So unlike the infinitesimal strain measures this is 0 for uh, any rotation any rigid body uh, translation and rotation. Now how about the other requirement that when strains are small this strain uh, we should recover the infinitesimal strain components. 
So to be able to do that we expand this and write in terms of um, all the terms we write in long hand and quantities that are shown in the red are the uh, non-linear terms and the quantities in black are the infinitesimal strengths. So for small strengths we you can uh, clearly see that quadratic terms can be ignored so we recover back the uh, all the terms in the red vanish and we recover the infinitesimal strain components. So this so therefore this definition is acceptable by the two yardsticks that we stipulated. Now we can also show that the uh, magnification of a line segment that is um, in the if there is a line segment PQ uh, with direction cosines n alpha upon deformation uh, if, if I define a quantity known as magnification factor as ds by ds whole square minus 1 that you can see that this is nothing but ds minus ds whole square divided by ds square and this is defined as a magnification factor of a line element. We can show that uh, in terms of the uh, green leg grand strain uh, tensor this is this magnification factor is given by this. So clearly here if the line segment is such that it aligns along with x1 axis uh, this uh, this is a, a repeated index implies summation. So the line segment that is lying along x axis is magnified by the quantity E11 and a line segment which is aligned with x2 axis is magnified by E22 and a line segment along this is magnified by E33. Now similarly if you take two line segments which bear an angle theta before deformation and they deform to this configuration we can show that uh, a measure of shearing strain this again we have discussed in the previous uh, one of the previous lectures is given by this and uh, the uh, strain E appears here. So here again if theta is pi by 2 and a line segment is aligned with x axis and y axis uh, here um, there are two direction cosines n alpha is direction cosines of PA and m, m alpha are direction cosines of PB. So if PA, is, PA aligns along one of this axis and PB aligns all along one of this axis then for example epsilon uh, E12 will be the shearing strain as per this definition between these two line segments. So the green Lagrange strain has this interpretation. There is another strain measure known as Almansi Hamel or Eulerian strain. Uh, here, instead of um, uh, you know eliminating uh, cap capital DX, we eliminate uh, in, uh, here in this case. If you see here, we obtained uh, the uh, difference in square of the lengths in terms of uh, DX in the original configuration. A similar equation can be de derived by using DX in the current configuration. So that definition takes us to this Almansi Hamel Eulerian or the Eulerian strain and this is defined with a notation small e and here ds square minus ds square is written in terms of lowercase dx and uh, we get uh, in this form uh, and this quantity i minus um, f inverse transpose f inverse uh, is uh, uh, defined as e. This is the Almansi Hamel strain measure. Here again if you take a rigid body rotation we can show that uh, we can first derive the, uh, the strain components in terms of displacement and we get in terms of J0 matrix uh, E is expressed in terms of J0 matrix as shown here this can be uh, verified. If you consider now uh, rigid body motions uh, X as R X plus X T of T again we can show that E becomes 0 and by expanding the terms we can again show that. Uh, it can be verified that for small strains the strain measure agree with the measures agree with the results from infinitesimal strains. Uh, two definitions of strain measure. We also talk about what is known as a rate of deformation. We call capital L as velocity gradient where Lij is defined as dou Vi by dou Xj. So that means dVi is Lij dxj. This L matrix furthermore we write it as uh, a sum of a symmetric matrix and an anti-symmetric matrix and this 
uh, symmetric component of that is known as rate of deformation tensor and W is given by this. Now if you consider the rate of change of the line segment ds is square rate of change of square of the length of infinitesimal line element uh, if you uh, consider this you can begin by noting that ds square is dx1 square plus dx2 square plus dx3 square and by writing this in this form we will be able to see that it is 2 dxt uh, dx transpose dx by dt and uh, we can rearrange these terms and use this identity and we can uh, actually show that uh, the F matrix and D matrix are uh, related through this. So this F dot matrix. <coughs> so uh, this is some discussion on rate of deformation. The relationship between D and derivative of the green Lagrange tensor can also be derived. I have indicated the steps here and we can show that E dot is F transpose DF. So I leave it as an exercise for you to verify this. Now how about measures of stress? We have talked about measures of strains. While defining stress uh, there are two alternative perspectives. In the first perspective we think of an internal force and an area over which this force acts. In Cauchy stress tensor which, with which we are all familiar uh, the force is a deformed uh, force is reckoned with respect to deformed configuration and area is also de uh, reckoned with respect to deformed configuration. Now this uh, uh, Cauchy stress tensor is uh, difficult to use because beforehand we will not know the properties of the deformed configuration. So that is what uh, makes us to think of alternative measures of stress. So in first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor the force is measured with respect to a deformed configuration but the area is transformed back to the undeformed configuration. So it is force uh, internal force uh, reckoned with respect to deformed configuration and expressed with respect to area uh, the distress is expressed with respect to area uh, in the undeformed configuration. In the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor the force is also transformed back to the undeformed configuration and area is also transformed back to the undeformed configuration. So uh, th this is one way of uh, looking at uh, uh, stress but the other alter alternative is to look at stress and strain uh, measures uh, as conjugate pairs which combine together to produce an expression for internal work done. So in terms of uh, a virtual work uh, concept uh, you, we have seen that uh, uh, strain energy stored in a body is expressed as product of integral of a product of stress and strain. So we can think of stress as something that is a conjugate of a strain measure so that uh, along with the associated with strain measure it leads to a proper definition of internal work done due to deformation. Now let us quickly recall the Cauchy stress definition of Cauchy stress. So we have uh, an object uh, in the in initial configuration body B I call it as B0 and this is a co coordinate system and this is acted upon by body forces that is forces which are proportional to the volume and surface tractions which are forces which are proportional to the area and upon application of these forces the body deforms and the process of deformation is opposed by an internal set of forces set up in the body and that internal set of forces is what creates stress in the body. To characterize that what we do is we consider the body in the uh, current configuration that is after the application of these body forces and surface tractions uh, the body has deformed and internal uh, force system has been developed. So what I do is I consider an imaginary region C and I cut this out from this configuration. So this picture represents uh, the current configuration with inner part of C removed and this configuration this uh, figure represents the current configuration with outer part removed. So what I do is at a point P I consider uh, an area element say delta A and that element has a in this figure it has an outer outer unit um, a normal uh, N and the internal force acting on this delta A produces a force vector and that is delta F. It, it need not coincide with the N nor it should be need to be parallel to the surface area. This 
this force system when imagined for this part this there is a hole here and n is a unit outward normal and delta f is the uh, uh, force acting on the uh, uh, elementary area delta a at p now the the fact that such internal uh, force system exist is the cauchy euler hypothesis so what it says is material occupying the interior of c exerts a force field on the material exterior to c similarly material exterior to c exerts a force field on material interior to c these two force fields are equal and opposite the interaction is free of any moment there are no couples okay is only the delta f is only a force uh, there is there is no moment there okay this is an uh, assumption that we make and, by, and under these uh, conditions we define stress at p i call it as t tilde n uh, there is n is a unit outward normal tilde is denotes that is a vector this is limit of delta a going to zero delta f by delta a delta a is defined in the current configuration and t tilde n is a vector normal stress is components of t tilde n along n and shear stress components of t tilde n perpendicular to n t tilde n clearly depends on n that means passing through this point p i can select so many area uh, segment that means this the way i have cut this uh, is not the only way i can cut it in many ways so the direction of unit outward normal can vary so passing through point p i can draw an infinity of uh, you know planes with unit out, outward normal n and uh, uh, we need to if you want to define state of stress at point p i need i should be able to specify what is t tilde n for any choice of the orientation of n so complete specification of state of stress at p requires all these t tilde n to be specified for any choice of n now stress analysis is determination of uh, stress analysis consists of uh, to determine uh, state of stress at all points in b so this is a, this looks like a tall order at any one point i need so many infinity of vectors and there are infinite points in b so how do we proceed so here what we do is we select a cardinal coordinate system and uh, uh, erect three planes which are mutually perpendicular passing through p and define the stress vector uh, on these three planes and have knowing that we will be able to specify stress on any plane that is inclined to uh, to this uh, cardinal plane so according to cauchy stress formula uh, the, the sigma is the stress tensor uh, the this is uh, t tilde n is the uh, stress vector uh, with unit out over normal n and this is given by this so the sigma is a second order tensor and this is symmetric because uh, there are no interacting moments and if you change coordinate system sigma prime is given by c sigma c transpose where c is the transformation matrix and uh, this i am quickly recalling i expect that you have this is not the first time you are hearing about all this so uh, the, this leads to the concept of principal stresses and principal axes then stress invariants and we will be able to find out maximum normal and shear stresses and the planes over which they act and when writing stress in finite element formulations as you have seen stress can be written either as a 3 by 3 matrix which is symmetric or as a column vector uh, by using what is known as white convention so we select elements in this order these diagonals this and this and i have sigma 1 1 2 2 3 3 3 then 2 3 1 3 and 1 2 so this is how we uh, arrange the column vector now cauchy stress is the most natural measure of stress because it finds out it considers the body in the deformed configuration when the internal force system has been set up and it describes that state of force per unit area in some sense that area is also recorded with respect to deformed configuration but uh, that itself leads to certain difficulties that is it is defined with respect to deformed geometry which would not be known during the solution process so in lagrangian description uh, equations are written with respect to the known reference configuration Uh, so this there is there is a contradiction between these two and consequently uh, it reaches the requirement that we need alternative definitions of stress measures so this leads to a couple of definitions for uh, stress the first is known as first piola kirchhoff stress so here what we do is uh, this is uh, the description is quite similar to what i uh, talked about now this this stress is defined what we do is this is the 
unit outward normal here and this is the force vector and I consider this area delta A I map it back to in the uh, what it would be in the undeformed configuration. So I will consider this delta F and this area in the undeformed configuration and set up a definition for stress. How do I do that? So we have seen that the rule for transformation of uh, areas is uh, dA is J uh, F inverse transpose dA and we have dF is T tilde n dA and T tilde n itself is sigma n. These results are known now. Now what I do is we introduce capital T tilde n I call it a stress vector acting on element dA that is this in this okay. It is introduced in such a way uh, that it produces the force dF that force is this df. So I have df as t tilde n dA and this must be equal to capital T tilde n dA. So this uh, and consistent with this definition t tilde n is sigma n I introduce another matrix P such that t tilde n is P into n where capital N is the vector of unit outward normals. So this quantity capital P is known as first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. This is a current force per uh, unit undeformed area. So when, uh, we need not know the deformed configuration to work with the first Piola Kirchhoff stress. There is a problem here and you can relate the, uh, the first Piola Kirchhoff stress to the, uh, the Cauchy stress through this relation using uh, the relation between uh, you know dA and capital dA as shown here. If you observe this matrix carefully we see that P is not symmetric and it has 9 independent components and when working with uh, you know constitutive laws with symmetric strain matrices uh, this becomes uh, inconvenient. So this is not going to be convenient for our modeling purposes. So that leads us to uh, introduction of a, another stress measure known as second Piola Kirchhoff stress. Now here what we do is we introduce a pseudo force vector fashioned after the relation dx is f inverse dx. I define dp cap as f inverse df. See I have here this df and I define with respect to the undeformed configuration another force vector. See a line segment which is again a vector gets transformed through this relation. So using as this is a vector and force is also a vector using the same transformation I define a force vector dp tilde dp cap as f inverse df. So this dp cap is f inverse df and uh, using uh, our relations of um, uh, definition of df I can write this as uh, f inverse for df I will write uh, t tilde n da and uh, again for t tilde n if I write sigma n da I can rearrange the terms and I get a quantity known as Sn dA where S is given by J f, f inverse sigma F inverse transpose. This quantity is known as second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor and as you can see S will be symmetric here. Sigma is symmetric and there is a F inverse and F inverse transpose coming here. So if you find S uh, transpose of S it will be uh, same as S. So this is uh, the second Piola Kirchhoff stress. So the relationship between second Piola Kirchhoff stress, Cauchy stress and the first Piola Kirchhoff stress is through these three relations. Okay. Now <coughs> to proceed further we need to set up um, the physical laws which are expressed as uh, you know what are known as balance laws that is principle of conservation of mass, principle of conservation of linear momentum principle of conservation of angular momentum and principle of conservation of energy. So these form the backbone of our uh, mathematical formulation of uh, problems of continuum mechanics and these basically relate the field variables like displacement, velocities, acceleration, stresses and strains and to the body geometry, applied surface tractions and body forces, boundary conditions etc. and they lead to the governing equations to be solved. <coughs> now, we need to elaborate on that but before that we can make some observations. When uh, introducing the notion of stress I talked about conjugate pairs of stress and strain. Uh, 
we can show that the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor and the Green Langerhans uh, strain tensor form conjugate pairs so that we can compute the strain energy stored due to deformation using this relation. This is S double dot E dot dV where V is the volume. So W is internal work done per unit time per unit volume in the reference configuration. So we start with this expression such as this and use either principle of virtual work or variational uh, approaches and uh, we will be able to express S and E in terms of the displacement fields and uh, those displacement fields will be interpolated uh, within an element and we derive the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, governing uh, structural matrices and vectors. So that we need to do. Uh, to begin our discussion what we will do is we will focus on linear relationship between conjugate stress and strain measures. Uh, so, for example, we will take that the PK2 that is Paola Kirchhoff second stress tensor and the Green Langerhans uh, Langerhan strain tensor are linearly related. It is like Hooke's law between stress and strain, but the stress is now not the Cauchy stress uh, and strain is not the uh, you know uh, Green Langerhans. This is Green Langerhans, but stress is second Paola Kirchhoff. So, this is what we will start doing, and if there is material nonlinearity, of course, this will be more involved. Now, in our development of uh, um, finite element formulations, uh, there are three alternative kinematic descriptions that are possible. So, they are known as total Lagrangian approach, updated Lagrangian approach, and co rotational formulation. So, I will just explain what these are, then we will consider the more details in the following lectures. In the total Lagrangian approach, the base and reference configurations coincide and it is taken to remain fixed, and the current configuration is this. So, we describe uh, the reference configuration to be the undeformed or the initial configuration. This is total Lagrangian approach. In updated Lagrangian approach, uh, the reference configuration is updated at each increment of loading uh, while solving the equilibrium equations. Uh, so, this is a current configuration and this is the um, reference configuration. This is the undeformed configuration. So, this reference state gets updated at every time uh, as the load uh, is incremented. In co-rotational formulation, uh, we start with the base configuration and it is used as a reference to measure rotations and co-rotated configuration is used as a reference to measure current stress and strains. So, it will this, this will uh, this all these figures are very exaggerated. Uh, here the co-rotated configuration undergoes rigid motion. For example, the CG of these two uh, configurations will coincide. So, it is a rigid body uh, motion and then from this rotated configuration we uh, characterize the current configuration. So, what we will do is in the, in the following lectures we will elaborate on this and uh, try to develop uh, finite element formulations. Uh, with whatever time that we is left uh, probably we will deal with total Lagrangian formulation for so simple line elements like bars and beams and I will also outline how to proceed for two dimensional and other problems. So, that we will take up in the following lectures. So, at this stage we will close this lecture.